I have, I, have, um, I have no financial interest in this, but I am over 50 and I do have a prostate gland, and I, I refuse to check it myself. <laughs> should you be evidence-based or should you be patient-centered? And they, they don't always go together, and prostate cancer is a, a great example of that, uh, where what the, uh, the gurus are telling us is that the evidence isn't that good, so you should be patient-centered. Uh, frequently, there are thousands of guidelines out there for many things. We all know this. We get inundated. And so we're, we're, we're stuck with this dilemma all the time of having to take what evidence there is, however contradictory, however, however gray, and make it uh, patient-centered. And then, of course, the other thing here is that two fingers are important. Uh, we all know that you should use two fingers to do a rectal exam because then you automatically get a second opinion. <laughs> and the really, the really weird thing about prostate screening is that People complain there's too much of it done, and we're talking about men. Like, men never come in. That's the myth, right? And yet here they are worried about getting their PSA test, and, and the complaint is there's, there's too much being done. And so if you're on the golf course, we're talking about this stuff, believe it or not, and I'm getting asked about it. I don't, I don't really bring my gloves along. Um, and you'll hear all sorts of jokes. Like, for instance, if masturbation really helped prevent prostate cancer, there wouldn't be any prostate cancer. <laughs> So as the poor, confused GP, I remember this graph. It's a bit old now, so I'm interested to hear what happens out of this. But as PSA screening became uh, interesting and we did it, the incidence of prostate cancer went up and up and up, but the mortality from prostate cancer remained flat. Except at the very end of the flat mortality graph there, it is trailing off a little bit. So we'll see, so there's maybe some evidence that it helps, or is that just due to better treatment by our urology colleagues? And then we have the popularity paradox, which I find very interesting, which I'll read here. The greater the harm through overdiagnosis and overtreatment from screening, the more people there are who believe they owe their health or even their life to the program, uh, which I think is interesting and somewhat true. And so you had fellows like Arnold Palmer saying, and this is as he's wearing potentially his Depends to play nine holes of golf. He had a prostatectomy and a radiation therapy after a PSA was elevated and pushed other men to, I tell them to get it checked right away, don't think about doing it, just do it, he says. So there is that attitude, and maybe not as much now, I have to say, uh, that men should take this seriously, uh, should go out and get this um, test and take care of their health. So, whoops. So you'll play the role with me today of confused family physician, trying to get through your day. Uh, we have a number of issues to discuss with patients besides spending half an hour in PSA testing. How do you handle that particular thing? And I'm gonna start with a quick show of hands. And you can't have your hand halfway up. So what I mean is, are you more inclined to suggest PSA testing or are you less inclined? You can't say you have a discussion with your patient. So a hand up if you're positive, and then we'll ask again if you're negative. And then we're gonna do this again at the end and try and get a sense if people have changed their minds. So in general, <clears throat> as a GP, are you pro PSA testing? Okay, we have only three or four. So obviously one of our debating colleagues is gonna have more trouble. And then are you more or less, and I expect everybody else's hand to go up, more or less against PSA testing? Okay, that's good. So that gives us a good feel for the room. Well, let's get into it. So this is John, and right away you can see the female bias in the preparation of this presentation. <laughs> He's 50 years old. He's 5 foot 10, 200 pounds, and good looking. He's married, fourth marriage, and... Um, <laughs> He's a pharmaceutical rep who enjoys hockey and is a fast food junkie. You are the family doctor. You haven't seen your patient, John, in quite a while, and uh, you, you tend to follow the recommended screening guidelines, uh, recognizing that they're not always evidence-based, and I'll throw this out there, that the colon cancer check program is based on three studies where FOB t testing was shown to uh, decrease mortality. None of those studies use colonoscopy for first-degree relatives, which is what we suggest in Ontario. And I'm not actually sure where that comes from, but those things, again, you can always take these things with a grain of salt. Uh, the, the people who make up these guidelines aren't necessarily always following the study. 
but you tend to do what they say and you're uncertain about your own view on PSA testing. Dr. House is a urologist. He advocates for PSA testing in men over 50. He makes decisions based on research. He is always right. Dr. McDreamy, he could get women to do PSA testing. <laughs> he is a urologist who does not recommend PSA testing for average risk men. So since his 50th birthday, John's wife, and I think this is the clue as to why men come in, has been encouraging him to talk to you, the family doctor, about cancer screening. John considers himself healthy and hasn't been to see you in a while. He and his hockey buddies have talked about PSA testing, some jokes, and they believe it's a good test to get. John knows he's a bit overweight and blames the fact that he travels frequently for his job and often eats on the run. Because his father died in his 50s of a heart attack, John regularly checks his blood pressure at the drug store and currently his blood pressure is in the high normal range. John enjoys an active sex life with his wife and does not have any problems with urination. There's a setup. Maybe that'll change. John's stepfather is a prostate cancer survivor, not a blood relative. John remembers him talking about the issues that he encountered after his cancer experience, but isn't really sure what happened. Didn't go perfectly though. John decides to visit your office for a physical exam. You check his blood pressure and it is 145 over 95. The rest of John's exam is normal, but you think his prostate may be a bit enlarged, although it's smooth in texture. John then remembers his wife's concerns and asks you about cancer screening. Because John is average risk and has no family history of colon cancer, you recommend he complete an FOBT. He seems unsure about that, but you remind him that his wife has already started screening and he agrees to take the test home and speak with her about how to complete it. Useless man. <laughs> you talk to John about current recommendations for PSA testing and try to explain why screening is not recommended for average risk men. Not an easy discussion to have in a minute, lots of other issues here going on. He appears uncomfortable with your response, as he was sure you would recommend it be in PSA testing. Because John's prostate is slightly enlarged and he seems concerned, you decide to refer him to Dr. House. I will now have Dr. Oh, wait, sorry, did we do this? Did we do this first? John visits Dr. House, who tells him that his prostate feels normal, but he does suggest a PSA test anyway. He believes all men over 50 should get one every couple of years. Dr. House gives John a requisition for a PSA test. John asks Dr. House why you told him the test wasn't recommended for average risk men. Now I'm good to. So I would now like to invite our esteemed colleague, well known to the entire universe, Dr. House. I'm playing the role of House. And how many people watch House? Anyone? Okay, so there's a few in the audience. Um, again, I have no personal conflict of interest here. We've already heard about uh, this patient sitting in front of us, the handsome devil. I'm going for that look with my hair. Um, so <clears throat> where are we at? What is screening, right? You guys all are well aware of what screening is. We're doing a simple test. We're working on a healthy population to identify individuals before symptoms arise. That's directly from WHO. What's a good screening test? Well, we, again, we all know this. It's sensitive, it's specific, it has a high predictive value. It's gotta be cheap. Patients have to tolerate it, be it a two finger rectal or one. Uh, I'm not sure, Rob, but most of my patients like one. Um, <laughs> suitable treatment options for the patients. And I'd like to stress that not all our patients post-radical prostatectomy are in diapers. Most men actually have functional recovery for urinary control. Sexual function's another story. John will have to address that. So PSA, PSA is our screening test in this patient population. Uh, ASCO came out with a direct statement saying it was one of the major landmark discoveries in cancer research in the 20th century. And I hold this to be true. I, I firmly believe this. So what's our evidence? Where do all these guidelines and recommendations come from? 
Well, we have randomized trials that look at PSA screening. Uh, in in the, ult the penultimate is an absolute reduction in cancer-specific mortality or in overall mortality. So when you're looking at these screening studies, it's one or the other. The evidence. Well, this one is out of the U.S. New England Journal published back-to-back -back articles. So we'll address this one first. And Jerry Andriol, who's one of our colleagues at WashU in St. Louis, was the first author. And this was part of the major screening study performed in the United States. They looked at 76,000 plus men age 55 to 74, so arguably a little older of a population, but okay, reasonable when they started this. 10 American centers randomized an annual PSA and DRE for four years, and then they looked at a 14-year outcome. What happened? Well, basically they showed, eh, not much difference. When you looked at the relative risk favoring screening, it was 1.09, but the confidence interval really didn't benefit. So this is being used as the primary piece of evidence against PSA screening. So what are the problems? There's some major problems, and it's actually surprising to most of us in this uh, field that this was ever actually published, yet alone in New England Journal. So this is, very, you know, in my opinion, a very poor choice by this journal. 44% of the men had had screening before inclusion in the study. Okay, so you've already selected your population. And then the non-screening arm suffered from huge problems with compliance. 52% of these men went on and had PSA screening during the study. This is your control arm. How many of you would believe a study where the control arm has over 50% contamination? Right? So there's a dilution of that screening effect, period, full stop. The Europeans, published in the same journal, the same edition, came out with their study. So uh, these are some of the big players in Europe in prostate cancer. They had 182,000 men. Similar age group, they do end before age 70, so this was 55 to 69. They linked seven randomized studies from uh, different countries in Europe. So that is one of the primary criticisms of this study is it's not one blanket study, but they had different startup dates and they had slightly different screening protocols. Men were randomized to screening or, or follow-up um, in the control arm and then uh, 13 years of follow-up for their outcomes. And remember, the natural history of prostate cancer is such we have to look beyond 10 years. 10 years, anything short of 10 years, forget the data. It's not going to help you. So the mortality was reduced by 0.4% in the screening group, 0.5% uh, in the control group. So there was a favorable relative risk a reduction for screening. But when you actually dissect the data, the core group, you, you, you see um, a reasonable uh, confidence interval of 0.69 to 0.71, or 91, pardon me. So this, this gives us some confidence to say there was a benefit in uh, prostate cancer mortality. They've further analyzed this study. So they've gone out further and they actually looked for adherence to protocol and contamination in this study as well. When they throw that out, you actually see an improved cancer-specific outcome in the screened arm, 30%. So 30% is actually quite dramatic. You do need to investigate 781 uh, men initially to come to uh, fruition with lives saved. Breast cancer screening, which we accept, number needed to investigate varies between 1,400 and 2,000 women. So we're actually half or a third of what we accept as a uh, uh, valid screening test. Subgroup uh, from Sweden, Gutberg, Sweden, actually shows even more dramatic outcomes. 
So this, uh, the Gutberg study uh, published, it's been published multiple times, the most recent iteration here shows the screening group versus control group. Here screening is in red. So if you go out to 14 years, the benefit of screening is even more prominent. The Gutberg study had 20,000 men and it was randomized uh, for screening or control. Prostate cancer mortality, we see that 0.9% to 0.5% with the relative risk of 0.56, so even more favorable. And it, the absolute effect was four times as great as the overall European study with the seven trials. Some of that effect may be due to younger men in the screened group for Gutberg, longer follow-up, and they did biannual screening. So what happens if we do a single measure of a PSA in a young man? So before age 50, John, John in our case has hit 50, but let's say we had done this at 49. While Lilja, the Swedish author, has actually done this, um, he looked at a single draw, went back, this was archived serum, and then they looked at who developed prostate cancer 23 years later, medium follow-up, very powerful study. And they diagnosed 1,400 men with prostate cancer. And basically they found if you had a low PSA at a young age, your risk was low. Intermediate, if it was 0.6 to 1 at a young age, and greater than 1 at a young age, you were high risk. So we can actually sub-select a population to further hone our screening in on, rather than completely becoming ostriches and burying our head in the sand. So, criticisms of PSA screening. I'll predict what McDreamy will say to you. There's no effect on overall mortality. Well, there isn't in any of the other major screen sites. Bowel cancer screening, breast cancer screening, forget it. None of the studies were powered to look at overall mortality. So cancer specific is the best we can do. Screening leads to over-treatment. So this gets to Rob's point. We're putting men in diapers, Arnie Palmer's peeing all over the place, uh, throwing off his golf game. Well, we have a study that randomized men to radical prostatectomy versus observation called PIVOT. That was published as well in the New England Journal. There was no difference in disease outcome, so death any cause, but actually when you looked at the morbidity in these men, there was obviously more morbidity associated with radical prostatectomy, but it wasn't as bad as what uh, the perception is. So quality of life, without a doubt, there's some impact on quality of life with treatment, but it may not be as severe as we think. So why are we even having this debate? You guys are all familiar with this Canadian Task Force recommendation. Came out in CMAJ last fall. Here's the evidence right there. So men, 55 to 69, we recommend not screening. Well, under 55, they say not screening. Over 70, they say not screening. With strong evidence for the former and the latter, the 55 to 69 age group, weak recommendation. That's because they ignored the European study and they made it equivalent to the US study, which was purely contaminated. How many of us will change what we do in practice for a weak recommendation? I argue that that's not a good idea. So our impact, what if we stop PSA screening? What if we do this? Well, the best estimate we have comes out of University of Michigan. Uh, this group published uh, just recently this past fall. They looked at the estimated number of deaths over a 12-year span if PSA is discontinued in the United States. We don't have Canadian data, but you, you decrease this by a factor of 10, that's probably going to be our data. So we may have 5,700 5, more deaths in Canada if we stop screening. If we continue the age of 70, we'll eliminate, uh, discontinue PSA screening at 70, we'll eliminate overdiagnosis about two thirds of the time, and if uh, we do take that strategy, we'll still fail to prevent about 36 to 39 percent of avoidable cancer deaths. <coughs> so my recommendations, Dr. House's recommendations, we have high quality data 
randomized phase three trials that we accept as, as the penultimate in medicine, that we reduce cancer-specific mortality in a subgroup of these patients. So PSA is a good test. McDreamy may come up and say, I'm joking. Well, to quote Dr. House, well, hard not to. There's nothing funnier than cancer. Thank you. Well, I'm sold. That, um, that guy knows his 30%, some of the things I heard there. Um, evidence of no benefit doesn't mean there's no benefit. You have to look past 10 years. And there's a, a good randomized trial that shows um, somewhere around a 30% reduction in mortality with PSA screening. So yeah, obviously you have to do it. And I'm, all, I'm also starting to think at this point that um, if I don't do it and John gets prostate cancer in 10 years, I'm, I'm on the hook. So uh, um, it might be a good idea. So he comes back and says uh, why, I, why I said that. And I have the consult letter in front of me and it's a, it's a difficult, difficult discussion to have. So maybe, maybe because of, now we're into a little bit of a debate here in the office, things are maybe a little tenser. I'll get another opinion because I just saw Dr. McDreamy speak uh, down around the corner and um, he, he seemed really reasonable. He kind of had another take on it. Um, I don't want to lose face here either in the office because the specialist is going against what I suggested. Um, ha it does happen to me all the time, to be honest. But uh, anyway, um, so off, off he goes to, to meet with Dr. McDreamy uh, for a second opinion uh, and, a, and a, you know, a fashion update, if nothing else. So thank you guys for uh, inviting me. Certainly, uh, I don't have this discussion about the PSA debate. It's usually already had for me. Uh, before the patients come in. So I appreciate how difficult of a job you guys have with this situation. But maybe I can shed some light on it. You guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay. I don't have any affiliation. So I'll, I'll start off with a highbrow. It will degenerate rather quickly. Um, <laughs> this is paraphrased from one of my favorite books, uh, Letters to a Young Contrarian uh, by Christopher Hitchens. And it's paraphrased from Sir Karl Popper. It's very seldom that in debate, when any two evenly matched antagonists will succeed in actually convincing or converting the other. But it is equally seldom that in a properly conduct conducted argument, either will go away holding the exact same position as that which he or she began. So in my mind, actually, there's very little to debate. Um, Steve alluded to the situation that there is no consensus for screening, or screening's not recommended for the average man less than 50 years old. And any man over the age of 70 or has less than a 10 to 15 year life expectancy, no PSA screening. So when we frame the debate, males between 50 and 69 at average risk should we be screening these patients. And I would consider this a rather a first world problem um, for a number of reasons. Uh, that didn't get as big of a laugh as I thought it would. <laughs> Maybe this is just commonplace. <laughs> um, so this is, I will concede the fact to Dr. House that prostate cancer screening does improve mortality. You cannot argue that fact. I agree that the PLCO is not a proper, not, not a proper study. So let's actually focus on the ERSPC. So this is the RSPC data. Uh, the top graph, men who had screening with PSA testing, the green squares are the number of patients who died of prostate cancer over a 10 year period. Men who did not have screening with PSA testing is in the bottom with slightly larger uh, green uh, uh, squares. So my question to Dr. House is how close to zero prevention does a screening test need to be before we stop doing it? And his argument to us is that it has to be less than 0.001% effective. So should men age 55 to 69 be screened? And I would argue when I've had this discussion with my patients, um, it depends on how you view the world. And I have the discussion with physicians as well. And so you can and, and as has been said before, you can't stay on one side, uh, you can't stay in the middle of this debate. You have to come down on one side or the other. So in my triangle of truth, uh, there's no realists allowed. 
So I'll, I'll pick on the urologists. So there's the solipsistic urologist who believes that everything's all up in his own head and he uh, tweets about all the things that he is doing. And so in that patient, he wants his mind to pro continue on forever and screening probably makes sense for him. There are the zealots <laughs> who come down and say that this is a crime that the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health has said screening is not recommended because we're killing men. And then there's the nihilist uh, who believes that perhaps what we do may or may not matter, but in my whole grand scheme of things, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I may fall into the nihilist category. <laughs> so what price is society willing to do to prevent one prostate cancer death in a thousand? And here's my personal power PDA, personal decision uh, analysis. So if a physician or a patient comes and says, do you agree, comes in and wants to know about PSA screening, I say, do you agree with Trump? And if yes, then their life expectancy is probably less than 10 years. <laughs> and so no screening is, is indicated. Uh, the second test that I would say is, uh, do you tweet? Um, if yes, I'll avoid microaggression, which is a new term I just learned, uh, and I'll send the patient to Dr. Potler for some screening. Uh, if no to both, no screening. So essentially, I don't recommend screening in my patients. But what is the actual price to that one individual patient? Because we can speak all we want about populations of people, but it is that individual in our clinic where you're trying to convince not to do a test, which I agree is very difficult. So the price tag is that the potential risk is that raised results plus a biopsy can detect a less harmful prostate cancer that leads to treatment that wasn't necessary. Now that's a mouthful, and so I'll break it down a little bit. So false positives is a major issue with the PSA test. 75% of people in the ERSPC study um, had to have or ended up having a false positive. And 15% of the screen population would have to undergo this. So let me bring you through this process because you guys send them to the urologist and then the patient comes back, perhaps limping, but uh, um, they come back. So you tell the patient they have an elevated PSA. They immediately worry, oh my God, I have cancer. But we have to do all the tests we can to figure out if we do or not. So you send them for a truss biopsy, uh, which I describe to them as uh, slightly less than the dentist. Well, I guess that's a wide uh, variety. But then they come back uh, three weeks later after the pathology has been read, and they're still worried about cancer. And then you tell them, thank goodness, 75% of the people that you screened, no cancer. We pat ourselves both on the back, and we say, we'll see you back in a year with another PSA test, and start that process all over again. The side effects of truss biopsy are not insignificant. Um, they're listed here. This is from a systematic review in the European Journal of Urology. Um, hematuria, rectal bleeding, hematospermia are the common ones. Pain, one out of five patients in a Finnish study said that they would not accept a repeat biopsy. Anxiety, hard to quantify, but I would estimate it's close to 100%. Um, the one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is that uh, there is a risk of death from truss biopsy. And a study by Rob Nam at Toronto estimates that on, on relatively good data, that the risk is 0.09% of all truss biopsies that you're doing. So my questions to Dr. House would be, if the reported rate of death from screening, i.e. truss biopsy, sepsis-related death, is 10 times the reported rate of death prevention, why are you recommending screening? What's the price of one man's life? Is the answer 10 other men's life? Indolence may le lead to impotence. How does low-risk prostate cancer behave? We diagnose a patient with cancer, and then we tell them, we don't need to do anything about it. Don't worry. Um, that's tough for a patient to swallow. I agree. But do low-risk prostate cancers have the ability to be what we all <coughs> consider to be a cancer? So what's the biologic behavior of low-risk cancer? This is an interesting study of 14,000 men with PSA or with Gleason scores, which is um, how we categorize low-risk patients. 
they found that 22 patients actually uh, metastasize to the lymph nodes. So even though the biologic behavior is small, um, it does have the ability to metastasize, and perhaps those are the people that we want to treat. But they were pathologically re-reviewed, and our current grading system upgrades them all to Gleason 7. So there has never been a single instance of a prostate cancer uh, that has metastasized to the lymph nodes in this very good study from Johns Hopkins University and three other um, big cancer centers in the U.S. So if it doesn't metastasize well uh, to the lymph nodes, well, maybe it gets around that and it kills patients other ways. So this is from the Physician's Health Study, um, and they looked at a different question, but what I wanted to draw your attention to was that patients in the Physician's Health Study who had Gleason 6 prostate cancer, which is a prospective study, according to 2,000 2, person years, um, 200 of them were treated with uh, radical prostatectomy, and there were no deaths in a prospective study. So it doesn't kill people, and it doesn't metastasize. So do we still treat Gleason 6 prostate cancer? That's the next question. Well, do we? When I came out of fellowship, I was still very theoretical and not much practical. And I said I will, will never take a Gleason 6 prostate cancer to the OR. Um, and, but that is not the case uh, in the US and uh, in many parts of Canada. This is over a 10-year period, and active surveillance is in increasing and improving, but we still take patients to the OR all the time for Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Um, and in the States, when you add in their data, up to 96% of patients in a VA study will actually be treated, um, which I think is, is wrong. So what about intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer? Are, are we actually even making a difference in those patients? And, and Steve alluded to the PIVOT study uh, where they randomized patients to radical prostatectomy or nothing. And after 12 years of follow-up, there's no difference in all-cause or prostate cancer specific mortality. Um, there were some trends in the forest plot of who we should be treating and taking to radical prostatectomy like patients in the high risk category and patients with PSA over 10, um, but traditionally these are not the patients that we took to the OR. We're, we're now looking at these patients to take to the OR because we feel that those are the patients who may benefit. Well, at least the treatment isn't that bad. Um, this was a prostate cancer outcome study from 2013 published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and the estimated five-year uh, rates of erectile dysfunction are 73% from the study. Urinary incontinence rates at five years are 16%. And bowel urgency, uh, interesting to me, uh, for both radical prostatectomy and external beam was about 25%. Now, this is uh, population type data. Um, there's lots of studies that suggest that every surgeon is not the same and that these outcomes change significantly depending on who is doing your surgery. So conclusion, and get ready for the mic drop, PSA screening saves one in a thousand males between 50 to 69 years old, but does that justify population screening? At the expense of side effects of the biopsy, which do include death, and I have seen one person die from a trust biopsy. <coughs> Diagnosing prostate cancer that will never affect a male's lifespan, and treatment that has major quality of life issues and for the most part is ineffectual. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. McDreamy. Um, I look at your consult note with some interest. I see that uh, although you agree that there is uh, mortality benefit to PSA screening, there is a huge uh, downside. And now as the confused GP, I'm sitting here wondering uh, what, what I should do with John. And um, given that uh, everyone in the room here is the confused GP with me, and we have a special opportunity with the two urologists, Dr. House and Dr. Madrini in the, in the room, I'm going to open it up for some questions and let people uh, clear the air a little bit, and then we'll take our, our post vote. And 
As the uh, representative GP in the room, I'll start with the first question. It's gone through my mind that um, the urologists are getting better at this, and there's evidence for that, I think, in, in those trials, that uh, treatment is becoming more focused, that frequently they'll, they'll just watch prostate cancer and not treat it. So that, that encourages me to do more screening and let you guys handle it. And I just wondered how, what you thought about that approach. So that's, that's actually encouraging, and maybe we can have some more hands up for Steve's side of the argument. Um, because uh, I agree, if, if you guys don't have time to, to talk about all of the issues surrounding this, if you trust that your urologist is now um, trying to avoid harm in the vast majority of patients who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer, then I think that you'd be much will. The PSA test is, is a blood test and a, a digital rectal examination. I mean, the screening's not that much. I have no issues with uh, PSA screening, except if it's not done thoughtfully, um, which I don't think it has been in the past, but we are getting much, much better uh, at it. So I, I would actually put my hand up for Steve. <laughs> I, I would just, I'd further add that I think the, the case selection is really critical. Um, we know men who are at increased risk, African American descent, uh, men with primary uh, relative with a history of prostate cancer. And I think one thing that's lost in all of this is that while prostate cancer incidence has, has peaked, we've gone up to as high as uh, number one male malignancy, it's the number three killer. So yes, there are many indolent cancers, but there are many intermediate and high risk cancers that we do diagnose, unfortunately, too late. So screening filters those out. I didn't show a slide, but there's a slide showing the mortality decrease that Rob had, you, you had the Ontario data. That graph continues to go down. And is it because of our better treatments? The actual mathematical modeling suggests about 30 to 40 percent of that's from better surgery or better radiation, better systemic treatment. But there's another 60 percent effect that's unaccounted for unless it's accounted for by screening. So we, there's definitely, I think, uh, an argument there, but we have to be selective and we have to individualize it. 